everybody. Uh, Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having a good day to this point. Uh, I am not going to be long, but I definitely want to take a moment to address something here. Um, there are teaching moments and lessons to be learned in almost anything you encounter uh, when you sit up and look back at it. We have been talking about the case with uh, Kalisha Hood and her 14 year old son and the killing of Jeremy Brown and all of the uh, details surrounding it and there is something else that has come to the surface that definitely needs addressing and I want to talk to you briefly about that uh, before I do, I want to remind you, we are in the middle of a fundraiser. The work we do in research, in uh, citizen advocacy uh, for our adults and our children. Uh, we advocate in school districts, in the judicial system, in the need for medical attention uh, and mental health resources and so many others. We also provide program implementations that are designed from the research that I do and we do at our research center. So again, if you followed me for the years that I've been doing this online, just imagine I've been doing it years before that. So we need your support. Again, look in the description box and uh, determine which way you want to support us and whether it's by clicking the link directly, whether you want to give to the Black Man Lead uh, Rite of Passage Initiative specifically, or if you want to give to the organization's Cash App account, there are a number of different ways to do so. Thank you in advance for that. So, uh, a couple of days ago, I reported on the fact that the young lady, Carlicia Hood, whose 14-year-old uh, son came to her aid after she was assaulted, uh, well, actually, during the assault uh, in which um, Jeremy Brown, a 32-year-old black male uh, who had gotten into a verbal altercation with uh, Carlicia, decided to hit her. Now, he hit her with the force that you would expect a man to hit another man, with a bald fist and all the way back and multiple times. Um, you can see on the video that she does not physically assault him. She is in a verbal disagreement and she is talking and he basically says, if you say one more word, uh, what is not clear are all the details that initially ended up with, uh, Kalisha Hood and her son being arrested and charged with, um, with first degree murder and then all of a sudden those charges being dropped so I'm going to give you some background information and then I'm going to give you uh, some insight on this lesson that I think or this teaching moment that I want to share with you so what we know now that we didn't know when it first went down and she was arrested and charged is that Jeremy had a girlfriend who was present at the time and was a reason that things escalated. She was in the background edging it on. So that was a combination for obviously a young male who isn't sure of himself of his, or his role in the community, uh, who hasn't had proper socialization and proper uh, manhood model to him. Anybody that sits up and thinks it's okay to assault a female that way definitely has not been properly socialized into manhood. Uh, this will often be labeled as toxic masculinity, but as I have stated in previous interviews and in some of my literature, true masculinity does not bring harm to those it's meant to cover. Uh, to call it toxic masculinity is actually an assault on masculinity itself. It is a part of a movement to make men, especially black men, more docile. And so what we often see is any bad behavior by a male, regardless of race, but definitely especially black men, is labeled toxic masculinity. 
Now, again, true masculinity starts with protection. It's the first thing before provision is protection. We love to talk about provision when it comes to men. That's because uh, the system and society has commodified manhood, especially for black men. We're literally judged by what we can do financially. And while we should be to a certain extent, that should be that should be so much more that we are being judged by. Yes, we have a responsibility to provide. It's front, it's it's up front, but it's not the the number one thing. Is am I as a man creating a safe environment for those I am meant to cover to exist? Can someone outside or even within the confines of my parameter that I'm responsible for come in and harm? someone within that parameter that's the first thing is i have a responsibility as a man to protect matter of fact i develop the capacity to protect as a young adolescent male before i develop the capacity to earn a wage my voice gets deeper i become larger than my female counterparts of the same age I develop a certain level of aggression tied to my uh, increased testosterone levels that also lend to me becoming stronger and bigger, more muscular. But this aggression is meant so that when it's time to step up and defend, I have the proclivity or the uh, yearning or the impetus to do so. It means that while I may not start something if necessary, I'll finish it. And it's meant to what? Put you in a position. One of the things we teach young black males as a part of the Black Man Lead Rite of Passage Initiative is that when you start to develop this difference in strength, in size, in aggression, it's not meant to be turned on your female car apart, your sister, your cousin, your girlfriend, eventually your wife. It's meant to ensure you have what is necessary to defend and protect her. So in truth, there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. It's a play on word. It's the same thing as the use of black on black crime as a universal exclusive phenomenon when the truth of the matter is 85% of black, uh, white homicides are committed by white people. And it's going to be the same with interracial enclave because violent crime is proximal. It happens within the proximity of your enclave of those you spend the most time around. So it is likely that you're going to be harmed. Now, do we have issues uh, concerning black on black crime. Obviously, we're here talking about it right now. Even though it's not black male on black male, it's still a black male attacking a black woman and losing his life at the hands of another black male. And this is a problem. This is a problem because my research tells me there are two statistical categories that research is done on, 19 and under and 44 and under. And in both of those categories, the number one cause of death for black men are other black males. For 19 and under, we're going to call those boys. Uh, 19 and under, uh, the number one cause of death for a black male under 19 is another black, black male under 19. Uh, for 20 to 40 or 19 to 40, uh, you're talking another black male uh, as the number one cause. Does this mean that that justifies or validates the idea of black on black crime? Not until we start talking about white on white crime, uh, Asian on Asian crime, Arab on Arab crime, because the numbers are going to be somewhat similar. Now, the intensity and frequency of which that happens is more tied to socioeconomic issues. Poverty is a great influencer as it pertains to uh, the level of violence in any particular area. Anytime the crime rate goes up, any I mean, anytime poverty uh, increases, the crime rate increases. When the crime rate increases, violence increases. It's simply criminology. It's it's not racial in its sense. It's environmental. Now, where it becomes racial is that we have more people uh, per capita closer to the poverty line. So we're going to have more people per capita participating in criminality and violence it's a way of survival um and so that's something that we have to look at so i just want to get that particular part of it out that in 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 when you look at this thing 
you have a young man who is about to exact violence on a woman in a way that a man should never do it and he ends up losing his life but there are a lot of things that come along with it that we are not initially privy to and the media didn't take time to either develop an understanding of or took uh the the angle of ignoring it because it wasn't as sensational what is going on is when it pops off as we have been conditioned to do is everybody pulls out their phones and starts recording well you can look and tell he knows that people have their phones out so now his ego is being cha is being challenged it's under attack it's feeling the pressure of uh, the idea, because he hasn't been properly socialized, he feels any challenge by a woman is a challenge to his manhood. He doesn't understand that the woman is at a disadvantage physically, so she's going to challenge you verbally. That's her weapon. And your responsibility as a man is to not to be moved by her weapon. When you are able to take the onslaught of a woman who is upset, and is coming at you in a negative way and you're able to resist the return of the volley of verbal assaults you execute power you execute you execute control you execute power you then you demand respect if she can't get you she can't trigger you to join in on something she's probably better than you at she's now going to sit up and re reel it for most part now you got some women that will hit you but this isn't where we're at right now. We're talking about the average woman. She's going to revert to making her point the best way. She can't physically overpower you in most situations, so she's going to out-talk you. She's going to out-insult you. She's going to challenge your manhood with certain things she's going to say. It's your responsibility, first and foremost, to know who you are. No one can verbally challenge my manhood. My manhood isn't up for discussion verbally. My manhood is executed in the things that I do each and every day. How I love the people around me. How I protect the people around me. How I handle the people in my family, even when they aren't handling me the way that I feel I should. It's all a representation of who I am as a black man so i don't look for people to validate me verbally if they can't validate me verbally they can't invalidate me and so that means no matter what someone says to me they can't get a rile out of me because you're talking to the person who knows who the person is and so but when you don't properly socialize when you don't have a true sense of identity of who i who you are you will you will you you, you will hang on the hinges of what other people think and this isn't just in black manhood, but we're talking about this because this is the case. So then he's sitting there and she's challenging him and he's looking at everybody's got the cameras now. Now it's a public matter because he understands these these this, these images are going to be loaded up on social media. These images are going to be passed around and emailed and text and everything else to, to people all around. And even outside of the city of Chicago, it's going national. It's going viral. It depends. And so now he's got to make a point. He's feeling tested. His manhood is feeling tested. But here's the thing where it really, it really becomes a problem to me. He's got a girlfriend who's in the background saying, hit that B-I-T-C-H. Kick her butt, and not butt, but he, she's basically encouraging him to assault this woman. First of all, I'm gonna tell you how screwed up this is. This is a black woman encouraging a black man to hit another black woman. When we understand that the number one cause of death for black women in America between the eight, black females in America between the ages of 15 and 44 is intimate partner violence, um, and most of the times at the hand of a black man, you are encouraging a black man to bring harm to a black woman. One of the biggest problems we have is we don't have trust amongst ourselves. And you actually would feel okay and encouraged to be with a man who would follow that order. Second of all, now, if some woman was beating on my woman, I'm going to come to her rescue and I'm going to get her off of her. And depending on what she's doing, I might get, get her off in a very aggressive and tough way to defend and let my woman know I got your back. Because I think that at some point, at some point, the 
woman is going to know, you just going to let her beat me up. No, I'm not going to let her beat you up, but I'm not going to go beat her up because y'all got into a scuffle. Now, if she's trying to bring harm to you and she's in a position where she can, I will defend you to the point that's necessary to make sure you're safe. I'm always going to do that. Now, if a man does something to you, he's got a different fight in front of him because he should understand, first and foremost, that you're untouchable. Second of all, he's more capable of bringing you harm that could lead to death. So I'm going to treat him as such. But back to this woman, she's encouraging him. Let me explain to you why that's a problem. Number one, like I said, we already have a problem with trust with black men and women. Number two, one of the biggest issues we have is domestic violence. Uh, number three, you're putting him, in, putting him in harm's way a couple of ways. Number one, even he, if he were to uh, assault her successfully and he isn't harmed, then... The chances are she has male relatives who are going to want to settle the score. So now he's riding around looking over his back for, for God knows how long. Number two, there's a judicial system that loves to jail black men. And so now you're looking at a situation and best case scenario, he ends up going to jail facing uh, aggravated assault charges. You know, uh, well, it could have been. Uh, because the, he didn't have a weapon. It could have been misdemeanor assault, but it was going to be assault charges that he would have faced. And you're encouraging him to do it. So now he's got the cameras. His ego is on tilt because he doesn't know who he is. And he's hanging heavily on how he's being evaluated. And the one thing a man does not want to feel is less than a man in front of his woman. So now she's saying kick up. So she's saying she's out of line. And the understanding in her mindset is that when someone gets out of line, male or female, you put them back in line. And so that's a misunderstanding of how the roles go and what should be done. But she is basically expressing the sentiment of culture that is detriment to the empowerment of our people. And so what ends up happening is she encourages him and incites him to do the very thing that takes her from, takes him from her that she's on social media now whining and complaining about. You, the one thing, look, look, just as our men protect our women, our women have a responsibility to protect our men also. Don't put your man in a situation that's absolutely unnecessary. And there are women out there because they know their man is with them, will sit up and start stuff knowing he's coming to their aids. But here's the problem, once you encroach upon someone's freedom once you engage someone in an aggressive manner you lose the ability to dictate their response see the idea is i swing she swing back i'm a win she's a woman and to me as a man i lost the moment i swung as a man, see, when you truly are operating from true masculinity, the very nature of who you are tells you to, de to defend. The moment I stop being a defender and become an aggressor, I've lost. I've lost my manhood. My manhood rests in my ability to manage my emotions and make good decisions, even in the heat of the moment. That's what differentiates me from my female counterpart. That's what puts me in the position and the possession of such forceful and devastating uh, physical cap capabilities in, in comparison, is I am supposed to know how to use it and when to use it. So the moment that a woman can get me to hit her, I lost. And I, 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 a while, a long time ago, I got to the point where if a woman can get me to argue with her, I've lost. Not that I can't hold my own. Uh, even my ex will say, you know, that I'm a good communicator. My point is the person I love the most, I don't want to argue with you because arguing isn't about winning. Arguing isn't about solving or, or creating a solution. Arguing is about winning. I, I'm not in competition with you. I don't want to win against you. I want to work with you. I want to build with you. I want to grow with you. And even if I'm not dealing with my particular counterpart, uh, when I when I get one, if I'm not dealing with my particular counterpart, I'm still dealing with someone that represents the beauty of black women 
and represents what I want and expect. And no, it's not dependent upon how she's acting. It's not dependent upon where she comes from. It's not depending on whether she's a stripper or a lawyer. It's dependent upon the fact that as a black man, I have a responsibility to protect black females. Now, where they are will depend on how I deal with them and how much of my space they occupy at any given moment, but it will never remove me from my responsibility to care for them. Everybody's on their journey. Everybody's in a certain space. Everybody's operating from their own experiences and coming from their own darkness and darkness and battling their own demons. I'm not finna judge anybody for where they're at, and I'm not finna make. I'm not finna to apply a lesser value to them because they're not where I think they should be. What I'm going to do is treat them in a manner that they have to question why they haven't been treating themselves that well. That's what a real man does. A real man isn't out to prove how powerful he is. He executes his power and his control and his availability to be what's necessary and what's needed. And that's something that we are losing ourselves in. Everybody's chasing the bag and most of these cats with the bag are, 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 are buying into a feminine mindset. So they're either behaving feminine, carrying purses, wearing dresses, or they are hyper violent. I got to knock you out. I got to pop a cap. I got to... Uh, whatever the latest term is for shooting somebody, I got to do that to show you how bad I am. I'm going to take myself away from my family and my kids to show you how bad I am. I'm going to risk my life or end up getting killed to show you how bad I am. And there's nothing in it when you can simply say, you know what, we're both having a bad day. Maybe you need to go your way. Maybe I need to go mine. We live to do this another day. Now, there are times that you need to defend and you need to defend ferociously and forcefully. And that's why you need to have a sense of who you are, because there is a moment where you may be removing yourself from your family, but it better be damn well worth it. You better be able to be sit behind them bars saying, if I want to deal with what I did, my baby girl will be dead. If I want to deal with what I did, my son will be dead. If I didn't do what I did, that young lady would have died. You better be able to sit up and have a good justification because at the end of the day, I believe the life balances out. I believe God designed the universe to balance out. But stupid decisions not only produce stupid outcomes, but again, now, while I'm harping on the female here, it's not always the female, but this time it was the girlfriend. That goes to being assured of who you are, so you choose wisely. When you don't choose wisely, you get around people who have no problem sacrificing you to satisfy the demons within themselves, and they will put you out there. Now, that could have easily been one of his boys saying, hey, man, you going to let that broad talk to you like that? Man, Put that on her back, man. You know, and, 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 and again, that goes the challenging to the fragile ego and him acting out of that fragility turns around and does something stupid. This time it happens to be, I don't think no man wants to feel less than a man in front of his woman. And a lot of domestic violence comes from the woman being able to make the man feel less than the way she talks to him, the way she handles him. And he can't go back and forth with her because he can't win that one. And so he strikes out. This isn't justification because there is no justification for it. It's wrong. But I'm telling you one of the reasons why it happens. <laughs> being disrespected. Now, as a matter of fact, the number one influencer for African-American adolescent and young adult male violence is the feeling of being disrespected. There are f four others. The top five are number five, urban hassle. All the things you see growing up in the inner city, ambulances all the time of the night, gunshots all the time of the night, navigating through gang violence just to get to school and home, navigating through drug use just to get to school at home, and all the other stuff that's going on, in the that's called urban hassle. That's the fifth most prevalent influence to African-American African -American adolescent and young adult male violence. Uh, number f f 
that's five. Number four is witnessing violence. You watch it and see it enough, you become desensitized to it, and it puts you on edge because you're always starting to believe now that it could happen to you. Number three, being the victim of violence will increase the risk of you at some point committing a violent act. Number two, the thing you hear me talk about probably more than anything else, the lack of proper racial socialization. When a black male is not properly socialized into manhood, developing a keen sense of identity and purpose and place within the community, he is more likely to commit acts of violence. And this is the part that we can control the most. We can socialize. We can socialize as we're supposed to in the home as mothers and fathers, but we can also socialize through rites of passage like black men lead. The number one influencer and the most prevalent influencer of African-American adolescent and young adult male violence is the feeling of being disrespected. And research shows that uh, Dr. Howard Stevenson and Dr. George DeGruy has done great work on this. I always try to acknowledge them um, because of their work in this area, because it was their work that launched my research. Um, and so Dr. Howard Stevenson pointed out that when working with these young males, that what he found was once a kid felt disrespected, it was almost impossible to mitigate their anger. But by something as simple as a touch of an elder male that they respected would mitigate action. So I'm about to, at the least, whoop your ass. But one touch on the shoulder by a man older than him that he respects. And he's still pissed, but he recoils. The importance of the presence of black men who have a concern and a care for what's going on in our communities is absolutely necessary. Again, the reason I am ad ad uh, adamant about expanding the reach of Black Man Lead. But let's get back to it. When you got a guy who's feeling disrespected, it's being filmed. His girlfriend is in the background edging him on to shut her up by knocking her out. Now what that probably tells me is he probably does it to her. And he now knows, I've seen this, so I know. He now knows if I don't knock her out, I'm gonna get yap yap all the way because the thing she gonna say, so you can hit on me, but you gonna let that B-I-T-C-H just handle you like that, so that's what's going on. You supposed to be this great, but you supposed to be, that was, and so all this is going through his mind at the at the most pivotal time in his life there are grown men older men in there i studied the video i studied everything except the actual shooting i don't watch stuffs them snuff uh videos anymore if i can avoid seeing it i'm gonna avoid seeing it i'm gonna get everything i else can so that i can operate and work from it if i've got to work with it but here's the thing right at the most pivotal time of his life there's nobody there with the voice of reason. The person that is the closest in his periphery is the one urging him the more. Other men in, in, in his periphery are either filming it or too afraid to say anything because they don't want the smoke. We've gotten to the point where black men have either become overly aggressive destroyers of our community or cowards. I don't want to die. Let me tell you something. One of the prerequisites for manhood is that one day you may have to put your life on the line to cover and to protect and defend what you hold dear. Dr. King said this, that a man that does not have something for which he is willing to die is not fit to live. I'm not going out there one day of my life hoping or trying or wishing or looking for a reason to die, but I have some. And it, it, I don't, and, and they're so deeply ingrained in who I am. I don't, have to sit up and think it's just certain stuff that i am not going to stand by and allow to happen number one i'm going to speak truth no matter how many people come after me and trust me they have i've lost clients 
I've had my life threatened, but I'm going to speak truth because what I believe in. And we need more men who are going to stand up and do the things that are uncomfortable in this world. If we're ever going to really truly, we talk about black power as if we're moving toward it. No, we're not. We are rapidly moving away from it. We're too fearful. We're too unorganized. We're too uh, dis disjointed and disunionized, uh, uh, di uh, fragmented. There's too much hostility and distrust among us. We have a gender war going on when we both need each other so terribly. We are at odds with one another. And you actually think we're moving towards empowerment. Why? Because some of us are moving through and uh, matriculating at a high level. Black women are graduating and going to corporate. You think we're actually progressing? Look at the next generation. It'll show you what we're doing. We haven't improved one bit. We got all these different jobs we talk about, but we haven't improved one bit. In, 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 in home ownership. We're still at 41% for the last 60 freaking years. We're not, we're, we're not progressing one iota in that area, and we di uh, we're literally digressing in others, regressing in others. And it's because if we can't unify, we can't anchor the next generation. We can't anchor them with the proper teachings, with the proper uh, ideals, with the proper values, interests, and principles that are going to govern who they are and how they move in their lives, what they're going to fight for, stand for, move for, operate in. We're too individualized. We only think about ourselves. None of that's going to work when you're sitting up and you've got a target on your back. And here he is in the most pivotal time of his life. And there's nobody there to pull him out. Nobody there to say, young, yo, young brother, ease up, ease up is good. I, I, I understand. Whatever you got to do to talk him down. I understand where you at. I understand. Nobody there to pull her to the side and say, come on, little mama. Come on, sister. It, this, is, this ain't what, what, what needs to be happening here. All the things we face in the world and we're attacking one. And I have to go in the hood in spaces where I could easily not come out and deal with this. But you know what? If I die in the hood helping, I die doing what I was supposed to do. I'm not going to be the person who sits up and says they crazy. I'm going to let them kill themselves. Because they're killing the future of my grandkids when they do. They're dooming my grandkids when they do. Because no matter how wealthy I become, no matter how affluent I become, no matter how many letters I put behind my name, no matter how many degrees I hang on my wall, my grandchildren are still going to be black and they're still going to have a target on their back. And there's no black community to hold and embrace them. They're going to stand alone and they're going to be mishandled and they're going to be misused. They're going to be mistreated and they're going to be isolated. And, the, and, and the, the less prevalent the black community, the more dangerous it becomes even for affluent blacks. And we don't get that. At a time, choose wisely, but in order for him to have chosen somebody wisely, he had to see who he was, and he had lost himself, or he never have he has never discovered himself, and so he didn't know who he was. He didn't know what was possible. He didn't know what he could end up doing. He had no idea of the potential inside because nobody nurtured it, nobody talked to him, nobody gave. So he found found value in his violence. Because he, he didn't see the power in his purpose. He left behind children who are now probably more in alignment with violence and have definitely experienced at least one adverse childhood experience, the loss of a parent via death, abandonment, or imprisonment. And I'm pretty sure just looking at this play out there a lot more aces in those children. And they're going to grow up and they're going to be out there in society. Look, we can talk about this until we blow in the face. At some point, we have to do something about it, right? Am, am, or am I wrong? Am, am I to believe that we think this is self-correcting? No, it's not self-correcting. Yeah, we're sending more women to prison and our, uh, per capita than any other race. Our black sisters are killing it. Young black brothers are doing a little bit better than we used to. Uh, but our black sisters, but here's the problem. The wealth gap is widening. 
it's widening. It's not getting better. We are educating more. We are looking more successful. Uh, we're going on trips to the DR and Jamaica and the Caribbean and Greece and all this stuff. And yet the black community is sinking into the abyss at a rapid rate. The wealth gap is widened. Um, black back in the teens, the 20 teens, it was 140 something, 150 something, uh, 150,000 household median wealth for whites and somewhere around 17,000 for blacks. It's now 14,000 for blacks and 180,000 for whites. It's widening. The only one closing the wealth gap on whites right now are Asians. Uh, and they're such, they sort of small in number in comparison that they don't get a whole lot of attention. They have the highest earning median in the country and they are doing what they need to be doing with that and they're uniting you know something i saw with asians that really interested me is i normally look at uh shows that you know allow me to do psychological observations of human behavior i just like realistic shows with real facts you can kind of see how people move what they think what drives the mind and how people respond to different types of therapy and suggestive engagement and this channel that I'm watching um, one of the commercials that was on I want to say all of May was this commercial where Asians from different places Cambodia Laos Vietnam Korea China Japan Malaysia all of these different places in Asia where in, in, in many instances, there's a lot of classism, especially between the upper echelon of the Asian community, Japanese and Chinese, and the lowers, Laos, Cambodia, and things of that nature. There's this, you know, distance, of, but they're working together in the community to increase their numbers, increase their, so now they're looking for ways that they are alike instead of ways they are different. And they're creating an even stronger power base. This is happening right now in America. And I'm looking at us, and we're doing the opposite. And we're expecting to win. No. We've got a lot to change. And unfortunately, this young black brother who didn't know enough about who he was to value himself and his role. Uh, and don't get me wrong. There are some women that are going to test you. There are some women who are going to test you. But you can never allow yourself to lose yourself. As a man, that's so important. But we have to actually teach this. We have to literally make this a part of the developmental processes for young black males. We have a responsibility to sit up and do more than complain and whine and talk about what's wrong. We need to have a plan. We are operating against opposition that have strategies, agendas, and plans in place. They have all these protocols that tell them exactly what to do when this happens, when that happens. And we're sitting up acting solely off of emotion, how we feel. And that's why we get caught up in so many disastrous uh, situations. Um, we are hell-bent on trusting the man to fix our issues. We're going to complain. You owe us reparations. They absolutely do owe us reparations. But if we're dependent upon reparations to fix our issues, we're going to have a problem. I'm going to tell you something. Power makes demands. But when you don't have power, you're ignored. It's almost like the kid throwing a temper tantrum. If you've had a kid, you know what I'm talking about. I've had a few. So I've watched it over and over again. Kid starts throwing a tantrum. At first, you get concerned because it's, 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 off, the, it's off the tilt. Kids throwing a tantrum. You can't you can't concentrate screaming and hollering, yelling, falling out. You don't want them to fall and hit the head. So you try. And then eventually you start to realize. Leave them alone. 
can't hurt nothing, can't do nothing, can't, definitely can't hurt me. And it's not going to change my mind. I said what I said. And eventually what happens? Kid does one of two things. Either throws the tantrum until they're totally exhausted, passes out, goes to sleep, or realizes you're not paying attention to them and puts it down, lets it go and say, what the hell, and goes about their business. Do you know they handle us like that consistently? Let them riot. Let them, ri let them protest. They have no way to harm us. They have no way to force us. Why? They have no economic power. Everything is responsive to the dollar, to the money, to the force. If you can't do anything, they don't care about anything else but money. They don't sit up. Everything they do is dollar based. And if you can't economic, if you can't impose economic sanctions to undesirable behavior, you just might as well prepare to deal with undesirable behavior. So how do you do that? How do you get to a point where you can do it? You have to start to build. You have to start to unify. You have to start to behave as a cohesive unit that if we, one, say this is the direction we're going, we all go in that direction. What happens then is an infraction against one becomes an infraction against all, but it stops being an emotional issue and it starts to be a protocol-driven issue. Now, instead of sitting up and throwing rocks at stuff and setting stuff on fire, we are changing banks, building banks, building credit unions, starting our own car companies, sitting up and creating bus companies, sitting up and doing the thing, sitting up and creating our own ride share companies. Wherever we sit up and feel like we're not being properly handled and properly represented, we're investing our money in building it. We're also, we should be investing in the uh, beauty supply industry. It is a $15 billion a year industry of which we drive 96 percent of the revenue which means that about four what about 14.4 billion of that is driven by the black dollar we own three percent of it and all of that three percent is at the retail level meaning we, we don't control pricing and that's how we can't get in it's because we don't invest in the manufacturing and distribution arms the vertical economics of any situation has to be controlled by the group if the group is to have footing in it so if i'm going to sit up and i'm going to say well and i'm, I'm like this any industry in which we control we dominate spending we should dominate ownership the seafood industry should be dominated by blacks we spend outspend white whites nine dollars to one we should dominate that industry we have to uh because that's where our power lies we literally can feed ourselves by operating in zones we dominate spending in but we are so consumer minded that we only are worried about having it not owning that's what got us into this problem in the first place. That's what Dr. King meant when he told uh, uh, Harry Belafonte, I'm afraid that I have integrated my people into a burning house. See, consumerism doesn't free you. Integration with a consumer mindset doesn't free you. Now, if we'd have integrated with an investment mindset, we would have been looking for ways to create businesses to get them to spend their money. But we were literally fighting to spend our money in their already established businesses. Their way, neglecting the businesses we owned. We integrated ourselves out of power. And we, we don't seem to understand that. So again, what we must develop in the male mindset is an understanding of self. And yes, you need to be able to be a provider. But that ability is built in young women there's nothing more powerful than building with a man the idea that he should have everything that you think he should have by the time you get him is creating an imbalance in the relationship where it's going to be hard for him to give you equal footing because he owned it and had it before you came along he'll use it to manipulate and control you he'll use it to sit up and get what he wants but when you build it with him he sees the value in you and I don't mean you got to do it equally financially. What I'm saying is you need to be a part of it because there are part, there's a part of it that needs you. There's a part of it that he simply isn't designed to do. His brain doesn't work that way. Yours does. His works front to back. Yours works left to right. You've got to understand that we were designed to work together. So instead of sitting up and saying, I tell, I tell young women this all the time, instead of sitting up and saying, where do you work at? What do you do? Ask him what his vision is. Ask him where he sees himself in five years. Ask him how he plans to get there. And then you determine if it's a fit for you. 
you know, is his temperament right? Is his focus right? Does he seem to be, how does he handle you? If he has kids, how does he handle the kids? If he has kids and the exes, how does he handle the exes? These are the things we should be looking at. These are the things we should be teaching our daughters. The, and, 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 and men, understand the value of her spiritual womb. You give the right woman your vision, she will birth it into the sixth dimensional realm and anchor it with her love and her faith for you. And when times get rough, you will literally feel her love and her support for you. But I guarantee you, it will come to fruition. If you've got will and drive, find the right woman and nothing is impossible. Find the wrong woman and it's horror. Same thing, women. Find the right man. There is no perfect man. Stop looking for this ideal perfect person, this knight uh, 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 in shining armor, wide men on the white. Look for the person who's committed enough to you to die for you, to protect you. If he'll protect you, there's a good chance he'll provide. And the rest will come. But men, we've got to start teaching it. On that note, look, I'm going to get out of here. I had no idea I was going to go uh, 45 minute plus. But again, it needed to be said. With that being done and said, I'm going to close out here. But with a reminder, if you believe in the work we're doing, if you believe in my research, if you believe in the messages that I'm delivering, the teachings they're coming from, years and years of research, ongoing research program, uh, development program, implementation, wraparound services, all of these things that we've done for years, we continue to do. We need your support. We need more. Don't get me wrong. The clicks, the likes, and the shares all help more people be aware. But we need real, true support. Show your love. Give. Donate. On that note, look, I'm out of here. Thank you for sharing your time with me. Take care. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping here. Hope that everybody is doing okay. Uh, look, I'm not going to be long. I'm here to talk to you uh, straightforward. Look, the easiest thing to do is to complain, to complain about what others, what others are doing to us individually and collectively, to complain about what's not right, to complain about what should be going on. Uh, that's the easy thing. The hard thing to do is to take action, to do something, to change the things that we are not satisfied with. For my entire adult life, I have spent uh, energy, effort, and time, and money into gaining an understanding of the things we go through, the things we face, the uh, mechanisms and machinations and, and, and all of the things that are working against us and what we can do to change that. And uh, uh, a couple of decades ago, I created the Odyssey Project as a research center, as a think tank to take what we find in our research and to use it to develop strategies and solutions. Uh, also, as a program development and implementation arm to take what we can learn and create these mechanisms and programs and initiatives to uh, deploy within the black community. We've done this for years. If you follow me, you know the work we do, we consistently do, and we'll continue to do. We need your support. It's that simple. Look in the description box. You're going to see a link to support or if you prefer to give via cash app, which some people do. There's the organization's uh, cash app account handle in there also. I mean, we got wraparound services that include mental health, uh, men and women, uh, special services and advocacy programs for women who have struggled with domestic violence or in, uh, in some instances, childhood sexual abuse or in uh, other instances adult rate uh, we have other wraparound services for men for training and job placement we are trying to make a difference but we do need support this is a massive and gargantuan effort uh, that's underway 
and it's so necessary. We're in last place in every statistical category from socioeconomics to politics to education to academics. Uh, we're in last place. And it's not because we are the worst. It's because we don't apply ourselves. We don't take action. It's time for us to take action. So I am challenging you to support the work we do. If you follow me, you know. So on that note, look, look in the description box and take action. On that note, I'm out of here. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be whoever I want to be.